Welcome back, everyone. Um, this is the second session of Urban Flood Monitoring Using Remote Sensing Observations webinar. And today, our speaker is going to be Erika Potest and myself, Amita Mehta. Last week, we had an overview of remote sensing data for urban flooding. We actually went over uh, what is involved in monitoring urban flooding, uh, not just natural um, forces or factors, but also uh, human factors such as stormwater system designs, um, how the um, urban development has occurred, uh, etc. And I just wanted to quickly show you what we talked about last week. We talked about a number of satellites which, uh, and also sensors which are relevant for monitoring urban flooding. Um, these satellites, we talked about what parameters to um, to use to look at, say, precipitation or terrain, um, or how the uh, slope is, or can you see surface inundation by using optical or uh, microwave data. So these are some of the things we talked about last week. We also talked about um, Earth system models such as uh, Goddard Earth Observing System, which provides near real time as well as hourly forecast of uh, weather systems and so specifically precipitation, winds, soil moisture, etc. Uh, we also talked uh, about um, CDAC. Uh, we briefly saw um, uh, where to get socioeconomic data. And we mentioned LIDAR high resolution topography data that we are going to uh, cover today. So that is going to be uh, today's session. We will look at some more um, observations based on remote sensing, how to access them and analyze them for observing or monitoring urban flooding. So this is the overall outline for today. Uh, first, we will have uh, Erica Podes from JPL. She will be talking about SAR-based urban flood monitoring um, and some challenges involved in them too. But then we will have a brief overview of LIDAR data and how they are used for urban floodplain detection. So it will take this opportunity to, to introduce um, what LIDAR is and how it, it's used for floodplain detection. Uh, then we will talk about um, data. These are specifically landsat-based urban data. It provides information about impermeable or human-built surface. Uh, which is useful for uh, deciding uh, where uh, water would infiltrate easily in the ground or not. And so we'll look at that. We'll also look at socioeconomic data, such as population and uh, uh, infrastructure data. These are available. So we will have an overview of that. We'll see how to access that. Specifically, then, we're going to focus on flood monitoring and mapping tools. So we will basically uh, have demos of two tools, MODIS-based near real-time flood monitoring or inundation mapping and global flood monitoring system that provides runoff information and flooding information. We will also talk about a couple of more tools, our Dartmouth Flood, flood Observatory, which is, uh, we'll just see what features uh, it provides to look at flooding. Uh, we will also have a couple of more uh, flood monitoring slides that uh, we will talk about, such as extreme rainfall detection system. And also, um, we will look at a global disasters alert and coordinate, coordination system, or GDACs. Um, we will have demonstration of monitoring urban floods using these flooding tools. We'll again follow the case study that we used last time, Ellicott City, Maryland, and Houston, Texas. And then finally, we will see what challenges are there in monitoring urban flooding using remote sensing. And then we will summarize what we saw in these two sessions. Again, this is just a reminder that our set uh, website is here, and here's the listserv. If you want to stay informed with RSET activities, please join the listserv. Again, this is the home of all our trainings, and every um, presentation, recording, and homework, they're all available from this site. So please use this resource. Okay, so we will 
Now, uh, invite Dr. Eric Capotes from JPL to talk about SAR based urban flood monitoring. Hello, everyone. This is Erica Potas. And next, I will discuss the use of SAR for mapping flooding at the urban natural interface. I will first provide a very basic overview on imaging radar, and then I will show some examples of radar images. If you're interested in the use of radar, I suggest you visit the RCEP website for the Introduction to Synthetic Aperture Radar webinar series from June to July of 2017 which provides a summary of SAR, including polarimetry and interferometry. Also, this August, there will be an advanced SAR webinar, which will be focused on land cover mapping, flood mapping, crop mapping, and earthquake surface deformation mapping. Let's start with the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the range of electromagnetic energy that spans from very long to very short wavelengths. A wavelength is the distance from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave. Wavelength is inversely related to frequency. So the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength, and vice versa. Very long wavelengths, such as radio waves, can be the length of a football field. And very short wavelengths, such as gamma rays, can be the length of an atomic nucleus. Note that most of the energy on the spectrum is not visible to our eyes. And that visible light is just a sliver of energy from the total amount that surrounds us. So I want you to think of this energy as waves propagating. Not much different than waves crossing an ocean, except that electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. Remote sensors are designed to operate at specific regions of the electromagnetic spectrum according to their intended application. Microwave sensors operate within the range delineated in this figure, which is, which is at a much lower frequency range than optical and infrared sensors. So to put things into context, the wavelength of light is about 390 to 700 nan nanometers, while for microwaves, it is on the order of 0 0.3 to 40 centimeters. Because of this huge disparity in wavelength, the features on this surface of the Earth appear differently in the microwave range than in the optical range. There are advantages to observing the surface of the Earth within the microwave range, and it is primarily that microwaves are not hindered by day or night or most weather conditions, as are optical sensors. So there are two main types of remote sensing observations, passive and active. Passive measures energy emitted or reflected by the Earth atmosphere system. Examples of passive sensors are optical and thermal. There are also passive microwave sensors, and they are called radiometers. They measure energy emitted from a medium in the microwave range. An active sensor provides its own illumination source. Examples of active sensors are LIDARs and radars, where a radar is analogous to an ultrasound. An instrument emits a burst of energy, let's call that a signal, and that same instrument measures the portion of the signal that is reflected back. Active remote sensing in the microwave range is called radar remote sensing. From here on, we will be focusing only on radar remote sensing, specifically synthetic aperture radar. This slide lists the advantages and disadvantages of radar remote sensing over optical remote sensing. The advantages of using radar, as mentioned in the previous slide, is that you can observe the surface of the Earth on either day or night conditions and under almost all type of weather conditions. Optical images are hindered by clouds or night conditions. Also, the radar signal can penetrate through the medium, meaning it can penetrate through the vegetation canopy, snowpack, or soil. And the extent of this penetration depends on the wavelength. Optical only sees the very top of the medium. So if it's vegetation, it's only seeing the top of the canopy. In addition, with radar remote sensing, there are minimal to no atmospheric effects or corrections needed as opposed to optical, where atmospheric corrections are critical for proper image interpretation. Finally, radar is very sensitive to structure and to the dielectric properties of the surface or amount of moisture within the medium. Of course, there are also disadvantages, and that is that the information content in radar is different than optical and sometimes difficult to interpret. Also, the radar images uh, have uh, speckle, 
and that's a salt and pepper effect that makes it difficult to interpret the image. Finally, the presence of topography introduces distortions which need to be accounted for. Radar pulses travel at the speed of light and can only measure the part of the signal that is reflected back towards the antenna. Most radars measure amplitude and phase. Amplitude is the strength of the reflected signal, which is also known as a backscatter coefficient, or sigma naught. Sigma naught is expressed in decibels. Phase is the position of a point in time on a waveform cycle. Phase is usually measured in angular units like degrees or radians. The phase difference between two images is a new kind of image called an interferogram. I'll start out by discussing the radar signal interaction with the surface. Keep in mind that radars are side looking as opposed to optical where you're looking straight down, radars are looking towards the side. And in this example, the radar is on the left um, looking towards the surface, um, the side looking towards the surface. And the figure illustrates the different backscattering mechanisms, starting with the one on the far left, which is specular scattering or smooth surface scattering. And it happens when there is a smooth surface, such as a water body, and the signal scatters away from the satellite. The result is a dark pixel in the image. The next one is rough scattering, which results when there is some level of roughness on the surface, causing the signal to scatter in different directions, but mostly away from the satellite. As the surface gets rougher, as shown in the next figure, the larger the signal scattered back to the satellite. The next signal interaction is volume scattering, which occurs when the signal is scattered in multiple directions within a volume or a medium. In the case of vegetation, the signal can scatter from multiple components, such as branches, stems, leaves, trunks, or soil. The final backscatter mechanism is called double bounce, which results when two smooth surfaces create a right angle that deflects the incoming radar signal off both surfaces, such that most of the energy is returned to the sensor. These areas appear very bright in the image. Double bounce is commonly seen in urban areas and flooded vegetation. The backscattering mechanisms delineated within a red box are the ones that dominate whenever there are urban areas or urban areas that are flooded, vegetation, and open water. Here we have an example of the radar signal interaction with the land surface. This is a pulsar L-band image at HH polarization over a site in the tropics. The brightest returns, especially along the river, are driven by inundated vegetation. The light gray areas are forests and the dark areas are either water or deforestation with different levels of uh, regrowth. This example shows rough surface scattering delineated by the yellow circle on the SMAP radar image. This area is an area of very low to no vegetation, an area that has been deforested. Agricultural fields with low vegetation, tilled fields, savannas, bare fields, or in general areas that have low vegetation have rough surface scattering. And this is all in relation to the wavelength, which in this case is about 24 centimeters. Also, sometimes rough water, because of windy conditions, for example, has rough surface scattering, meaning that water will not appear completely dark. This example shows volume scattering delineated by the yellow circle on this map radar image. This is a forested area. In this case, the signal interacts with different components of the vegetation, most likely the branches, trunks, long stems, and the soil, causing the signal to scatter multiple times and a significant part of it be returned to the satellite. The intensity of volume scattering depends on the physical properties of the volume, that means the, the moisture and the structure, as well as as well as the characteristics of the radar, such as the wavelength, polarization, and incident angle. Finally, this example shows double bounce delineated by the yellow circle on the SMAP radar image. This is an inundated forest. It's very, very bright, meaning that the tall trees, or the trees, are on standing water. 
The reason that the signal is so strong is because the signal penetrates through the vegetation and it bounces off the water, which is a specular reflector, onto the tree trunk or other components of the tree and then bounces back to the satellite. We cannot measure the amount of standing water, just that there is water above the surface, under the vegetation. The same backscattering mechanism is seen in urban areas, which is the next example. This example shows the problem in using SAR data for looking at urban flooding. As mentioned in the previous slide, double bounce is characteristically seen whenever there is flooded vegetation and when there are urban areas. The reason for this is because you have two surfaces that are perpendicular to each other, causing a large portion of the signal to be returned to the satellite. For example, in flooded vegetation, you have a smooth surface, which is the standing water, and an orthogonal structure, which is, for example, a tree trunk. In urban areas, the smooth surface can be a road and the orthogonal structure uh, can be a building. This image shows the city of Manaus in Brazil, in the top of the image, and the surrounding area. It is an L-band SAR image from a Japanese satellite sensor called PALSAR. Open water is very dark, and the very bright or white areas around the river is flooded vegetation. In the top is the city of Manaus, which is also very bright. So urban areas by themselves are already very bright because double bounce dominates. Even if you have flooding in an urban area, double bounce will still dominate because instead of a smooth surface being a road, it is now a water surface. Therefore, a flooded urban area will look, or will still look, very bright in the amplitude image. Where SAR is helpful is in identifying new open water bodies and new flooded vegetation in the surrounding urban area or in open areas within the urban environment. I will show an example of that in the following ex uh, slide. Here's an example of flooding that occurred in the city and surroundings of Houston, Texas in the United States. This flooding was caused by a large hurricane called Hurricane Harvey in late August of 2017. These are radar images from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 satellite of before, during, and after the event. The images cover an area of approximately 220 by 190 kilometers. The area marked with the red circle is the city of Houston and some of its suburbs. There is no significant change in brightness over the city itself. However, inundation in the surroundings is discernible because ponding of water forms smooth surfaces that create specular scattering, and those areas appear dark. Note some of the water bodies that are present in the middle image, which I have marked with red arrows, uh, that are not present in the far left or far right images. Also note the disappearance of some of these water bodies a couple of days after the event on September 5. This is a false color RGB image of the same area. Here I used two images before and during the event. So channels R, red, and blue contain the during the event image while channel green contains the before the event image. The areas where there is a predominant color means that the backscatter value for that area was higher in the image containing that color or combination of colors. So for example, anything that is green means that backscatter was higher before the event. Areas that are pink means that the red and blue channel values, which in this case are the same, are higher than the green channel. Therefore, wherever green is higher means that before the event, the backscatter was higher than during the event because the area is now inundated and there is water or there's a water surface that is causing specular scattering and hence a very dark backscatter return. So the green areas, you can interpret those as areas that are now inundated. They're standing water. The areas that are pink means that they're, they are higher backscatter than before the event. Therefore, that area is either inundated, so there's inundated vegetation, or the soil moisture content of the soil is higher than before the event.
note that the urban area remains high in both images. This is another similar event. Here we have two Sentinel-1 radar images. The false color images are BV, BH, and the ratio of BV to BH for each date. This area is part of the state of South Carolina in the eastern coast of the United States. A large hurricane called Hurricane Matthew caused major flooding in this area on October 2016. The two images are before the event and shortly after the event. Note the orange areas that pop up along the coastline after the event. This indicates that these areas are inundated. In summary, SAR backscatter is not good at assessing flooding in urban, directly in urban centers, but can assess flooding in the human natural interface within or surrounding urban areas. This list shows the legacy, current, and future SAR datasets. The ones with the green box indicate that the data are freely available, which you can access through either the Alaska Satellite Facility or the European Space Agency's Copernicus Hub. Note that there are historic datasets, though there is not continuous data per se. Of the operational SAR satellites, the only one whose data is freely available is Sentinel-1, which is a European Space Agency SAR operating at C-band. There are future satellites coming up with SALCOM, which is an Argentinian SAR at L-band, and there is also radar, the RadarSat constellation. NISAR is a NASA Indian Space Agency L-band and S-band sensor to be launched in 2021. And Biomass is a European Space Agency P-band sensor also to be launched in 2021. And this chart shows current and future set satellites grouped according to bands. And the far right indicates the repeat cycle. Note that they have repeat cycles of just a few days which allows for a constant monitoring capability, especially with applications related to flooding, which are very dynamic events and require observations as constantly as possible. If you want to learn more about SAR, I suggest you take a look at the Introduction to SAR webinar series from last year, June, uh, July 2017, and also tune in to the upcoming Advanced SAR webinar series in August, which will cover land cover mapping, flood mapping, crop mapping, and mapping of surface information using interferometry. Thanks very much. So thank you, uh, Erica. Uh, we will have question and answer at the end of the session. Um, and so now we are going to go ahead with the rest of uh, the agenda for today. We will start with LIDAR data for urban floodplain detection. So what is LIDAR? So LIDAR, it's a, an active instrument similar to radar, but this uses light. So it's light detection and ranging as said here. And uh, so what it does, it can fly on an aircraft or a satellite. Uh, what it does, it, it throws a light pulse on the surface and measures uh, reflected light pulse. And then processing is done to derive information about uh, surface and atmospheric features based on this uh, light that is received back. And so LIDAR, uh, there are several types of LIDAR, particularly three types, um, ranging LIDAR, differential absorption LIDAR, and Doppler LIDAR. So ranging LIDAR, which is of our interest uh, for urban flooding, it measures the time between emitted and reflected light pulses. And that determines the distance of an object that was the target where light pulse was thrown. So then next one is the differential absorption LIDAR. This particular LIDAR uses two different wavelengths and it is used to measure temperature, density, pressure uh, of trace, trace gases and aerosols in the atmosphere. And the last type, uh, Doppler uh, LIDAR, it senses shift in wavelength due to motion of a 
target that is moving. So that is used for measuring, say, wind velocity. And so these three LIDARs are uh, used for remote sensing of surface and atmosphere. The one that we are going to talk about is ranging LIDAR. And here is a, a LIDAR map uh, that, you, that shows that you can, you can resolve buildings and streets by using the data, by looking at the backscattered light. And so ranging LIDAR, which um, it, it, it's used to generate three-dimensional information about the shape of the characteristics of the Earth's surface. And, and it is high resolution. So you can see that this is Washington, D.C., that you can see many features in 3D. This is the uh, Washington Monument. And then these are all different uh, structures that you can see. There are two types of ranging LIDAR. The first one is topographic uh, LIDAR, which uses near-infrared wavelengths most of the time. And it, uses, it, it is used to map uh, land, like shown here. Other type of ranging LIDAR is bathymetric LIDAR. And that uses um, green light or um, visible light that is used to measure seafloor or riverbed elevation because it can penetrate in the water. So these are the ranging LIDARs. And the data that are used for urban flood detection, flood plain detection is topographic LIDAR. And so where to get these data? Uh, so one site is USGS as shown here. It, it's a project, it's called 3D Elevation Program. This is for the US uh, that includes Alaska and other territories also. Um, and it is open source. It is high resolution. It has multiple special resolutions as shown here. Uh, from one meter to 30 meter resolution uh, topography data can be opt obtained based on LIDAR from this site. Um, you can pick which region you want, and then you can also pick special resolution. Um, and that um, here is the legend if you just want to look at the map visually. But if you want to download, select the data and download, you can pick which resolution you actually want. Now, these data are available only on the US, over the US. Next, um, LiDAR data are available from NOAA. Uh, this is a NOAA Coast Watch, and they provide um, interagency LiDAR product. Uh, multiple agencies are collaborating, and they use these high resolution data uh, in multiple applications. The one that we are interested for urban flooding is topographic LIDAR. And here is the map uh, where topographic LIDAR is available. So this is um, along the coast also um, on, the, on land, you can get high resolution topography based on this NOAA Coast Watch interagency LIDAR product. There are also um, other data sets which are regional. Um, FEMA sometimes has aircraft-based LIDAR data for elevation mapping in, in various regions where this flooding is occurring or, um, you know, so they have urban mapping LIDARs and here's the website where you can get information about these data. There are commercial and open source other data available too. Uh, we are focusing mostly on open on open source data here. So one example is this is state of Maryland. They also have a LIDAR program. And here's the web page. If you go there, you can look at the um, elevation height based on LIDAR um, from this. And then you, you have uh, multiple layers. And you can visually see it. Um, and you can download the data from this site as well. So there are several options. And the reason for using showing this data is that they are higher resolution. So if you remember the demonstration we had last week using SRTM, uh, which was 30 meter resolution to derive slopes and um, say flow direction or drainage channel. When you use in, in GIS, you can get these parameters. You can do the similar QGIS or other GIS analysis using LiDAR data 
to uh, identify where the slopes are or where the channels are. In this uh, webinar, we've decided to focus on SRTM because it's global data set. The LiDAR data set that we are showing here are for US only, but they're very useful in detecting floodplain and they are widely used for detecting uh, floodplain over the US. So FEMA, for example, uses LiDAR elevation um, to not just detect floodplain, but also for flood risk analysis. If you see uh, why LiDAR data are more useful is because they can resolve um, you know, around the building flow or on the street, and you can see um, um, all the landmarks with, because of high resolution. Um, and UNESCO also uses LiDAR elevation data for flood modeling. You can get more information here. Um, this particular figure shown here is from the paper from uh, Turner et al. Uh, listed here. So using LiDAR for regional flood modeling, um, this is really a topic of research and exploration. You will find many, many uh, papers in the literature. Here is just one example which is uh, showing uh, different two different LIDARs, composite LIDARs um, and this airborne LIDAR. Uh, so you can see uh, in here how, um, where the flow would be that is um, identified here. So depth is shown here in both images. This is in North Carolina. So this brings us to uh, another data set uh, that we just talked about that is Landsat-based urban data. And we will also look at uh, additional socioeconomic data. Uh, we saw this site last week. This is um, CDAC um, that has multiple socioeconomic data, um, global urban data from the Landsat satellite, global reservoirs and dams, uh, low elevation coastal zones, global roads, energy infrastructure, they all can be downloaded from this site, and we will have a brief demo at the end. Um, so what we're going to start with is look at this data set from Landsat. It is global man-made impervious surface data set, so it's called GMIS. And here is the reference if you want more information on how it was derived. Um, NASA and USGS, they have put together a global land survey data set from Landsat starting from Landsat 5 onwards. And this particular um, GMIS data set is derived from 2010 uh, as a target year, which uses Landsat 7 and 8, so ETM plus and only uh, data are used uh, in deriving GMIS here. Um, th so data sets, again, have 30 meter resolution, uh, has, uh, so per pixel percentage of impervious cover is is given in the data set. Also, per pixel uncertainty in impervious cover also is available. And this is a companion uh, data set of global human built up and settlement extent data set. So here is an example now of Houston. Um, and what you see here is impervious surface percentage given in, in from zero all the way to 100. And we're looking at city of, um, like this is uh, Paris, this is Moscow, this is New Delhi, this is Northeastern United States. And this particular uh, figure shown here is zoom in for Houston. So Jimmy's data, it clearly shows um, here you have less um, area which is built or impervious. If you go downtown, you will see a large percentage area that is built, and that's why it's impervious. So there are roads, there are buildings, parking lots, and so that's where water cannot go in. So these data, why are they useful? So in urban area, rainwater removal can occur in three ways. They can run off. Uh, if there's natural slope or terrain, it just runs off from an area. Uh, or it gets infiltrated into the ground, or then there's stormwater drainage that takes the water out. So estimating impervious urban area 
using GMIS that would help in assessing areas where no infiltration can be expected. So these are the areas, if they are in low-lying area and they're impervious, it most likely they get uh, waterlogged. And so com combination of uh, terrain data and GMIS data would provide uh, information about where uh, uh, water logging can occur or ponding even after the rain is gone, you can expect ponding. And um, if there are decisions to be made about uh, where there is pumping uh, of water is needed or where, where this equipment is needed, then maybe if looking at terrain and GMIS data early on uh, can help identify where these um, uh, hotspots are for water to, to accumulate and flooding to occur if there's a lot of rainfall. So that's why these data are useful. So um, next, what we're going to do is uh, go to the flooding um, tools, but we're going to have a demo where we will look at how to, to get GMIS data and also look at population density and other data from CDAC. So we'll have a demo at the end. Overview of flood mapping tools. So we're going to talk about two types of tools here. Um, Precipitation-based flood tools um, are quite useful, such as Extreme Rainfall Detection System, and that uses uh, GPM iMERGE data. Similarly, Global Flood Monitoring System also uses precipitation data, but it is, it's using a TRIM Multi-Satellite Precipitation Analysis, or TMPA data, that we talked about last week. So once we have long-term trim GPM combined data available, then GFMS will be transitioning to using GPM iMERGE data. So the two tools that we are going to look at are ERDS and GFMS. So Extreme Rainfall Detection System, which is one of the tools used by UN World Food Program for Emergency Preparedness, uh, that is based on near real-time GPM iMERGE data. So for what it provides is accumulated rainfall uh, or it provides alerts uh, based on this rainfall in near real-time. And it also provides forecast of alerts and precipitation, and that information is used from NOAA Global Forecasting System or GFS rainfall. So uh, what ERDS does is looks at near real time data and compares it to global precipitation climatology center land based rain gauge data climatology. So it takes mean of this gauge and looks at how um, um, deviation is from the mean uh, from near, in near real time. And based on that, uh, there is a threshold decide for, uh, decided for extreme rainfall and potential for flooding. So anywhere you would see these red dots, they show, uh, they show um, uh, potential for flooding or flood alert. So this um, figure shown here is a recent flooding and landslide, if you uh, remember from the news, occurred on 9th of July. Um, there was a rain system moving in. There was a lot of uh, rain in, in in southern uh, part of the country, um, and uh, that you can see that alert was provided by ERDS uh, based on uh, iMERGE data. It also provides uh, rainfall. Um, if you go to the site uh, of ERDS, you can see um, how rainfall is accumulated over every um, three hours or so, and then you can see accumulated rainfall over um, several days. You can also see forecast uh, GFS forecast. So this particular tool, uh, it, it helps you look at um, urban area quickly. You can zoom in and see where uh, there is potential for flooding. So this, because has forecast also from GFS, you can start monitoring where there is likelihood of flooding. And then as you come to near real time, also you can see alert based on iMERGE. Once you see the alert in urban area, you can move to 
this particular tool, which is Global Flood Monitoring System. This is uh, the website from University of Maryland. Um, this flood tool focuses between 50 South and 50 North because it's based on tropical rainfall measuring mission uh, multi-satellite data. Uh, it uses rain rate every three hours. Also, it provides accumulated rainfall every 24, 72, and 168 hours and uses a hydrologic model uh, along with this rainfall as forcing to provide stream flow rates and flood intensity at 1 8th degree or approximately 12 kilometer resolution. In, in near real time or closer to a near real time, uh, data are available at one kilometer also, but the archive data are there at 12 kilometers. And these data are available since 2013. As we mentioned uh, last week, TRIM is no longer flying, but TRIM-based calibration is used with other national and international constellation of satellites to come up with this TMPA product. And when it is combined uh, with near real time IMERGE data, we will have a long term trim uh, GPM combined precipitation data available um, most likely later this year. So here is the um, layout. When you go to the website, you will see the map. You have date here. This is the flood detection or intensity depth above threshold. Uh, here is the millimeter above threshold. And there are features such as you can zoom in and zoom out, uh, pan the map using these arrows. Uh, you can pick a particular latitude and longitude um, pixel in here, which is about 12 kilometer. You can either click on one of these or you can enter latitude longitude of the urban area. Uh, within the urban area, if you know a particular point, you can enter and then you can enter a time that you are interested in to see a time series also. So you can see map as well as time series. And as we mentioned, this um, GFMS uses um, uh, runoff generation from the uh, University of uh, Washington Variable Infiltration Capacity Model or WIC model. And so precipitation is used as a forcing. And uh, there is also uh, NASA has a reanalysis product for uh, modern era retrospective analysis for research and applications. This also is uh, uses the GEOS 5 model that we talked about. And so um, GFMS uses uh, MERA and TMPA is forcing to, 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 in the WIC model, to come up with hydrologic uh, balance and then deriving runoff and stream flow. Here are all the feature, uh, features of GFMS that we talked about. That is map navigation, zoom in, zoom out, um, select individual grid point, and uh, for plot different variables. So you can have flood detection uh, using threshold, um, depth, or you can have stream flow, or you can have accumulated precipitation. Um, you can animate the map uh, that we will have a small demo at the end. And here is an example from uh, from the recent Japan flooding again. Uh, this is on uh, 6th July, uh, this 9 uh, GMT, 9, uh, and this is Japan. You can see that um, the green means it is there is potential for flooding. It is above uh, threshold um, intensity. Um, you can also see there are locations where you have a higher uh, threshold, um, a depth above threshold where there is more flooding occurring. And this particular latitude longitude near Hiroshima, like 35 uh, north and 132 east, um, if you enter that and look at time series, you can see how the flood intensity changed over time. So this is every 12 kilometer uh, within the map. You can see how uh, flood detection, you can do uh, intensity changing, or you can also pick to display stream flow or precipitation in the same manner. So this tool provides, um, once you use ERDS, to you to see alert where flooding might occur when the flood starts occurring you can go to gfms 
and start looking at where there is uh, these colored areas and where there is flooding occurring. Now, GFMS also has experimental product that is forecast of stream flow and intensity, flood intensity, that is based on GEOS 5. So you can um, choose to look at forecast using GFMS also. So once you know that there is a lot of rain and there is, um, there is flooding going on, uh, the next step is to see where there is surface inundated. So where there is usually no water, where do you see water? And for that, the, there are flooding tools which are based on uh, land cover detection. And they basically use optical radiation or visible radiation. Um, and as shown here, different uh, um, substances such as soil, vegetation, water, uh, they all have different spectral characteristics or signature. So here is water in visible and near infrared. You can see, you can detect water. And so that is the principle use that you look at a particular uh, spectral band and see the reflectance. So that tells you that previously dry, if you keep looking at reflect, reflectances that you can decide that previously dry surface now is inundated. And so for that, um, MODIS data are used. So both Terra and Aqua uh, have MODIS and so reflectance um, from MODIS, they are monitored and change in them is, um, is helping to decide where there is surface inundation. So there are two tools that we talked about, MODIS Neural Time Flood Mapping and Dartmouth Flood Observatory. They both provide this information. So MODIS based inundation mapping, here is the example of Mississippi River flooding. This is in 2016. Um, you can see this is March and this is May. And clearly you can see uh, where there is um, a lot of uh, surface inundation going on based on these images. Um, and as we mentioned, it just looks at uh, near infrared and um, visible reflectance to decide where surface is inundated. So there is also a global reference um, water database that all the water bodies are available uh, in this data set. And so the flood detection is done with respect to those uh, water bodies also. So those water bodies are always marked. And if there is inundation, which is, so if there is overbank um, river flow and that goes around, that can be seen. Or if there is heavy rain um, and urban flooding is done or coastal flooding is done because of storm surge, MODIS can help um, detect that surface inundation. One thing to notice here is that uh, MODIS cannot see through clouds. So if there are a lot of clouds present, then surface is obscured. And so even if there is inundation going on, uh, one cannot see it. Um, also, this is moderate resolution, about 250 meters. So um, Landsat, which we talked about, also has uh, similar bands like optical and uh, near infrared. So uh, experimentally, these data are also used to detect flood at 30 meter resolution. But operationally, uh, this tool provides uh, daily inundation maps. So that's what we are focusing on. Um, so so here, is, here is the website where you can see that once you go, you can pick any um, 10 degree by 10 degree tile uh, zoom in, click on the tile, zoom in, and then you will be able to see where there is flooding, and we will have a demo at the end. Again, this provides data since January 2013, and you can see it in near real time. The data available are uh, either images or there are KMZ files or geotiffs that you can see. MODIS flood water is the one that uh, we are going to see, uh, which shows where inundation is. You can see surface water, that's permanent water bodies are available. And all this information can also be used as geotiff. 
So here is the example. We zoomed into um, Japan again, and this is um, if if you see this is again um, 9th of July, I believe. And what you see here, the red areas shown here, where it shows surface inundation. So if you look at the GFMS map and uh, where flooding is occurring, and you look at MODIS, sometimes you would see that. Not all the flooded areas are observed, and that is because uh, presence of clouds. And so um, there are more sophisticated techniques or more regional threshold developed to derive where flooding might be occurring. And one such example is this paper um, referred to here by Ahmed and Bolton. They have used um, their own technique they still use the same reflectances, but they derive their own threshold to map flood uh, in Mekong Basin. So um, in, in the urban area of your interest, you may want to um, look at this MODIS inundation map uh, that is available on site, on, online, but you may also want to look at uh, raw data and derive your own threshold based on uh, surface observations uh, as um, this paper. So the next tool is Dartmouth Flood Observatory. Uh, this also is based on MODIS real time mapping, and here you can see um, alerts on um, the website, uh, and uh, it focuses on near real time events, also extreme events, and. Additional information available from DFO is from Landsat um, and other images such as um, Esther uh, Terra images. Um, EO1 is no longer flying now, but there are archives available based on EO1 data. Um, there are uh, use of Cosmos SkyMed and Sentinel um, SAR. Whenever these data are available, if you remember, MODIS is available daily, but all these data sets, um, other satellites, they have revisit time ranging from 12 to 16 days. And so these data are not always available when there's flooding going on. But if they are available, then DFO displays them on their maps. And there are other um, information, GFMS, rainfall, um, I merge rainfall is provided. There is a river watch that you can uh, look at in here too. So that uh, this is a useful site. So uh, this brings us to our first demonstration. So um, just quickly going over, we talked about uh, Landsat imperme impervious surface data, and so that and other socioeconomic data that we're going to see next, and then. After that, we will have demonstration of all the uh, flood tools that we just saw. So uh, just one minute while I share my screen with you all and show you some of the data access tools uh, that we just talked about. So we're going to start with uh, the socioeconomic um, data that um, we talked about impervious surface data. So the idea here is to just give you an um, overview of if your own region, if you want to uh, download the data, how would you do that? And and for that, this is the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center site, CDAC. Um, one thing to note here is that um, your homework uh, required that you can register for NASA Earth data. And for accessing some of these data sets, you need to register through NASA Earth data. So for CDAC also, you need to uh, sign in. I've already done so, but you can register and then log into this site by going here. And then there is a lot of information that you can browse, but the main thing that we want to point out is this data or data sets. 
you can search data sets. Once you go to data, you will have all the data sets available on this page. And as you can see, there's urban extent polygons, there are settlement points, um, you will see global population. Uh, and this is the data set that we talked about in the presentation. This is based on Landsat impervious uh, surface or GMIS. If you want to find any particular data set, you can find it by name also, and it takes you to the data set. We are going to click on the data set. And this has information as well as a citation for this work. If you're going to use this data, uh, we recommend that you cite this and more importantly, actually go through the documentation so that you know all the features and all the caveats about the data set. So simple way is you can you could document, you can look at metadata, you can uh, look at maps, but for data downloading, and this is again, uh, if you are doing urban flood modeling, you may want to specify boundary conditions, or your, what kind of boundaries are there, and if you are uh, deciding where to put impervious surface or where your infiltration has to be controlled, then you actually want digital data downloaded, and that is what uh, this step is showing. Um, you can just view and download. This is the tab to go to. Okay, and this brings you to the map, global map. This is navigable. You can uh, zoom in and zoom out. And uh, I've, here I'm just going to show, uh, you can already see the urban areas where their impermeable surfaces are, or even small uh, cities and towns are shown. On left hand side, uh, you can see impervious surface percentage, GMIS. There's also this human built up and settlement extent. Uh, you can look at that uh, if you like. Um, the reason we picked this was because it's, it, it's helpful for urban flood modeling. Uh, you can look at population density. This is the latest one uh, was done in 2015. There's also a projection available for 2020. And uh, we've chosen this and you can choose your um, opacity to display here, the transfer, uh, how transparent you want your map. And here is the legend. So just for viewing, you can zoom in to any area, like we looked at Houston earlier, and you can see where there is 100% or where there is really more like less than 10% uh, impermeability. For actually choosing the data on a smaller region, smaller, you can uh, pick a tile, you can pick an entire country, you can have shape file, or you can have a rectangle and polygon. So once you pick this option, which I've, I've done, so for simplicity, you can pick uh, a square and just allows you to draw in here. And there's some information about how to manipulate and redraw or delete this polygon. You can read that. You can click on it. It allows you to actually download data by clicking on one of the points. And right now it is becoming difficult, but so I already have downloaded this data that uh, you will be able to take in QGIS and we will work on, it allows you to actually pick um, which resolution you want. So right now it is not working, but I will show you how uh, the data actually look like. Um, you will be able to uh, look at the data. But in any case, you can zoom in and um, at least figure out uh, what is going on in what area. So you can zoom in as much as you like, and then it will show you individual communities and where there is impermeable surface is. So I have downloaded this as TIFF file that you will be able to use at the end of uh, this demonstration. Similarly, you can download uh, or display global population data uh, along with that, and it shows you, uh, again, you can look at the uh, legend uh, where uh, how much population this is per kilometer per square kilometer so you can look at 
in combination um, where it is, uh, there are more people and around low lying or um, impervious area where you might need to have warning or you have to have a rescue plan. So uh, this is one data set that we, we talked about that you can download easily once you log into NASA Earth data. And you will have a chance to work with this data at the end uh, when, we, um, when we work on the exercise. So this brings us to the demonstration of some of the flooding tools that we talked about. And we're going to start with uh, the global flood monitoring system. So here is the global flood monitoring system. And you can zoom out to see the entire map that we just so this is 50 south to 50 north global data. Uh, and uh, we saw that you have different dates. You have way to um, do zoom in and zoom out and pan. You can do time series. What I wanted to show was the availability of different parameters here. Uh, the uh, stream flow flood detection is there in millimeter. You have the 12 kilometer resolution actual stream flow also you can see. Um, then there is a um, surface storage, uh, there is inundation map, there is runoff, and there is uh, rainfall instantaneous, three hourly, uh, one day accumulated, three day accumulated, and seven day accumulated rain. So you can actually zoom in, and I have tried to do that here on uh, Ellicott City, which is, or Maryland, it is just this area that was flooded, this uh, white areas you see here are the streams. And so if you looked at stream flow, you will get the values over there. All these green areas you see outside the um, stream channels are actually, it's the runoff data. And that gives you indication of where there is above uh, threshold flooding likely. Now this is um, about between one to 10 millimeters. So there is a low uh, probability, and this is for the uh, through today at uh, 3 GMT. Uh, but what I wanted to show was you can look at, so it is, you enter time, um, date, month, and year. So we're going to look at 27th of May, which was the um, day when there was flooding in uh, Ellicott City, Maryland. So this animation is going to go quickly. So I want to point out that you can look into in this general area. Also note that this data are actually every three hourly. Last week, when we looked at the animation, we looked at um, uh, iMERGE data, which was every half hourly. And we looked at time series that was half hourly. That gave us pretty good indication of exactly when the rainfall was uh, picking up and then it, it subsided. In here, because it's three hourly data, there is a little um, uh, less uh, information that way, but it does provide you overall um, information about where, uh, how the rain systems are moving and where um, uh, there is um, likelihood of uh, flood intensity being about threshold. So that means actually uh, flood occurring on the ground. You can animate this and you can see how this area shows um, some of these area around the streams. And this is the Ellicott City area. It shows, uh, and then it, I'll go in this back to today. But then it shows in near real time, even if you pick on any of the pixels, if there is enough um, um, flood intensity, then it also shows a time series if you provide a date here, that just like we saw in the case of Japan when we were uh, during the presentation. So uh, this is uh, the way to, you can also, there's data availability. You can download these data here, okay? By year, uh, they are given here and, uh, and, and month. So you can go back and download the data. Uh, they are in binary file. So uh, you may have to do some pre-processing if you actually want to display it. Uh, but so this is a, a uh, quick way, once you know the flooding is occurring, you can start monitoring which area 
show above uh, threshold flooding, and then you can further start monitoring uh, with either in situ data or even um, there are you, you, uh, weather forecasts. You can look at uh, current weather forecast and start looking at what is happening in, in that uh, area. So this is GFMS. Next, we are going to look at uh, MODIS flood uh, inundation project. Uh, that, that's the near real time uh, flood monitoring. And this is MODIS phase inundation mapping that we just saw. And here, uh, I'm just going to um, pick on Houston just to see. So these are all uh, 10 degree by 10 degree latitude longitude grids, as you can see. And once you know that there is a flooding from ERDS, uh, you have a you have warning from GFMS. You know that there is about threshold flood frequency. Uh, the next thing you want to know is is there any surface inundation occurring? And when you click on a particular area, I'm going to pick uh, around. Houston area here. This is um, almost near real time, but you can go back in time. Uh, you have archive data. And 4th of July is the time we wanted to look at when there was major flooding over Houston. Okay. And here is are all the products that you can see. You can have MODIS flood water. Uh, you can have a shape file that you can view in GIS. Uh, for simplicity, we can use KMZ file, which you can open with uh, Google Earth. So if you click on that, uh, and we'll do that in a minute, but you can also see that is uh, just PNG, a uh, simple map available image. You can see surface water. So wherever there is permanent water, uh, that also is given inside. You can download that as shapefile or KMZ. And then there is surface uh, water product and total water product. So surface water product, GeoTIFF, has all the information. It has permanent water, plus if there is any flooding going on. So this is permanent water. But if there is flooding going on around this area, it shows up as a red mark. Uh, we're going to look at Modi's flood water. And we're going to open it with um, Google Earth. Once you open it, um, you can zoom in. And here's Houston. Now, notice that uh, clear flooding shown here is in the coastal region. Uh, you can see this is where a lot of because of a lot of rain on 4th of July. But if you zoom in, you will also see places where you have indication of surface inundation. So this is now within the city. It's not um, to just a word of caution here is that if there are too many clouds present, you cannot see surface. But wherever you can, uh, it is showing you where there is likelihood of uh, or where there is inundation going on right now. So you can save this as shapefile and get into your GIS and then look uh, along with other data sets. So this is MODIS inundation. We also briefly talked about this Dartmouth Flood Observatory. This has near real time maps and it shows uh, based on MODIS plus whatever other satellites are available, such as Landsat or even Sentinel SAR. It provides uh, information where there may be flooding going on and how many people are being affected. Uh, this information is there. You can go through this. There is a river discharge um, available. There's a river watch, wherever there are in situ measurements available, and microwave satellite from TRIM, GPM, and they are used to come up with uh, flooding. So this is mostly for near real time, but major flooding from past is also shown. Um, 
The other site we saw uh, earlier for Houston, that one uh, uses um, simple thresholding on modus reflectances. In here, uh, there is also some supervised classification going on. So we encourage you to uh, visit this uh, site and look at all the features. And this allows you to uh, monitor uh, near real time uh, flooding. So as you can see, this sites provide flooding information anywhere and everywhere it is but there is a feature that you can zoom in and look at the area of your own interest so that is the important part that you can zoom in and see what is going on and um, it provides information about uh, all the colors showing um, what information uh, our earlier um, webinars about flooding also describe these tools in detail so you can visit our set webpage to get uh, more demos and information about this site finally we also mentioned a um, site called global disasters and alert coordinate system uh, coordination system or gtax this has uh, quite a few um, i mean a number of disasters are, are involved uh, covered here so there are earthquakes tropical cyclones and floods and so flooding is something you can when there is near real-time flood going on you get information about where the flooding is going on you can get socioeconomic data you can have in situ reports and it also provides you summary of what kind of damage is going on uh, if you look at the uh, resources it also has resources from different satellites here. You have flood map based on passive microwave. Um, you can look at um, accumulated rainfall. This is from TRIM. Um, and uh, so both the Joint Research Center from European Center and NASA and NOAA, they all, multiple space agencies contribute. It also has MODIS flood map um, given in KMZ like we saw. So this is also a useful site um, to look at when there is an urban uh, flooding uh, occurring, then you can get uh, more information. RCEP also had a special webinar on GTAX um, in last in 2000, early 2017. So you can uh, look at GTAX features in that webinar also. So what, what we saw was we looked at um, CDAC, we looked at GFMS, we looked at MODIS near real time flood mapping, and we saw DFO and um, also uh, looked at how different things can be used together, um, starting from ERDS all the way to looking at surface inundation, looking at population. Uh, last week, we looked at slope also we looked at uh, terrain in general we had high merge precipitation every half hourly so these information pieces can be combined together in on a gis platform say uh, to do a better flood monitoring and management decision making so uh, what we recommend and you will have some time to explore now for about next 15 20 minutes we are going to do a QGIS analysis. Once we go through the analysis, we will have um, a little summary of this uh, webinar series, and then we will open the floor for all the question answers. So I'm going to ask you to go to RSET website. Your homework was actually to download and install QGIS on your um, computer. So if you want to follow along this exercise, you will follow the, uh, you can go to online trainings. And if you do not have a QGIS on your desktop, and if you still want to watch this, you're welcome. Or you can stay online for a question and answer session. You go down to 
monitoring urban floods using remote sensing. This is the web page where uh, we have all the information. So you can see that the first week um, information presentations and homework and everything is here, both in English and Spanish. You can view recording by going here. For today's slides and homework assignment is there. This homework assignment is due by 15th of August. And you can go to this site, Demo GIS Tips, and it will ask you to uh, open the file and save it on your computer. You can save it on your computer. These are some of the TIFF images that we are going to see with QGIS. I already have downloaded this uh, uh, TIFF images, but um, please take a few moments to download the data. So most, date, most TIFF images, all the TIFF images that you will download, they are for the Houston flood case. So you should see uh, TIFF images for this impervious service surface over Houston. You have iMERGE data. You will also see um, SRTM terrain and slope data. So this is open source QGIS as um, some of you must have downloaded. I'm trying to get this open street map in here, if bear with me here, but <clears throat> excuse me. Once you go to the QGIS, you can add raster data and go to the TIFF files you saved. From there, you will see this impervious surface percentage. So once you get the layer in, you should be able to see the map here. This is again Houston area. You can put in this open, um, you can go to web open layer plugin. If you have it, you can include a open street map or um, you can just view the, the TIFFs where it actually shows, uh, you can zoom into a particular area and see you can change the property Look at single band pseudo color. This is more for your, um, so this is for impermeable surface. So we can pick any color you like. Um, and we can have zero to 100%. You can look at 10 different intervals. It allows you to see where there is high, this is totally impermeable surfaces. Could be a parking lot, it could be roads, or could be a like big shopping center, parking lot, or something like that. You can make it transparent to see what's underneath. And what else you can do is you can add layer about resampled iMERGE from last week that we had. This is Houston and this is interpolated iMERGE. Uh, if you remember, uh, last week we uh, interpolated this uh, at uh, 30 meter resolution from about 10, 10 kilometer resolution. 
So you're not actually creating new information, but you are bilinearly basically distributing rainfall just to get some idea where there is a uh, high rainfall. And you can see this 4th of July flooding in this area, uh, there was uh, more rain. And you can uh, see this is all accumulated rain is about 102 to 108 millimeters in some of these regions. If you again add raster and add your um, SRTM level, uh, I'm not showing on your computer wherever those TIFF files are, you need to get them in from this add raster layer. And once you have SRTM layer, you can click that in. And we had picked a small region in the, this part where there was a lot of flooding. Um, you can zoom in a little more. You turn the rainfall off. You can see that in general, this is the terrain in meters, vertical meters. There is a higher sloping region in this part, and then there is low terrain in this part. So generally, the tendency of water would be to flow this way on larger scale. But if you look at the slope, you can see that all the buildings can be obstructing, and there would be like small scale slope. So this is the downtown area. And all the, all, all the higher slope areas are basically showing buildings. And lower slope shows the streets in between. Um, so you can see that, although it's, it's, it's small. But in general, you can see that large scale tendency of water to flow would be from this side to that side. And then in within the city, you can see the slope where there is more likely for water to be accumulated. You can look at where there is more impermeable surface. So then you can see where there is low sloping and then impermeable surface. So it is some of these areas where there is low slope and high impermeability. These are the areas, so you can combine that to come up with where you would be focusing uh, to see where there is water accumulation. Um, and so looking at everything together uh, will help you decide to, to understand the urban layout uh, you are in. So I, uh, we will give you a few minutes to work with you. If you're using ArcGIS, you can use that too. There are also comments I see that um, QGIS is slow in responding. Um, so that's OK. We just wanted to demonstrate that how these different data sets can be downloaded, uh, reprocessed, and put into QGIS. So hopefully, uh, at least some of you got some um, flavor of how to use these different data sets. So the flow we went through was to just know about different data sets, then go to specific websites um, and download them, uh, subset them temporarily and spatially as best as we can, um, as we saw that they all have different spatial temporal resolutions. And then after putting them in GIS or combining them, it makes it a little better to understand what is going on in the urban area. With all the limitations, there are also strengths that you can have this continuous information over a large area. So uh, last week and this, um, we looked at um, number of data sets that can be used, how to download. And we looked at these two flood cases. So in summary, actually, I want to 
end with challenges in monitoring urban flooding and how it it can be improved. So there is, it, it, there are challenges in the way that uh, remote sensing data that we saw, uh, they have relatively low spatial resolution, especially for precipitation, it's about 10 kilometers, which uh, for urban uh, flood flooding, it can cover entire urban area. Uh, weather forecast we saw from GOS5 also was of the order of 30 by 50 kilometers. Runoff and stream flow had relatively moderate resolution too, like 12, low resolution, 12 kilometer. The inundation map that we saw from MODIS was 250 meters. Landsat based inundation or impermeable surface that we saw that have 30 meter resolutions. SRTM also has 30 meter resolution. SAR is a especially higher resolution, a little low uh, temporal resolution, uh, about 12 day uh, repeat time. So these, first of all, to combine them to make sense, it, it requires a little bit of processing, as we saw. Also, we saw from um, Modi's case that if there are a lot of clouds, optical data cannot see through. And so then even if the surface inundated, it would be difficult to see. But then there are uh, microwave data sometimes as used complementary as you will see from DFO site. And you can also have a supervised threshold uh, based on in situ measurements for your own urban area. And you might have a better uh, chance to look at flooding. LIDAR data are high resolution, but they're not available everywhere. And you have to plan um, during flooding, people fly LIDAR on airplane. Uh, it requires, uh, there's expenses involved in that and planning also. So all the open source data that we talked about, they have challenges, but they can be combined together and they can be used as inputs to urban flood modeling they can use, be used in addition to in situ data. As mentioned here, uh, smaller urban areas are a real challenge. You uh, may not see them clearly or resolve them. Since each urban area is unique, uh, flood management also requires special solutions. And so in addition to rainfall, terrain, urban extent, urban uh, there is planning required, there is stormwater removal design required. Drainage system capacity also is crucial for deciding how, how much rain can an urban system sustain. So it, it's really a combination of remote sensing and in situ uh, data, as well as uh, flood modeling. They all have to be combined to actually do effective management of flood uh, in urban areas. And so that brings us to the end of this series. Um, we saw SAR uh, information earlier. So if you have questions about that, um, Erica Portis can answer your questions. And we'll open the floor for question answers. There is a homework available on our set site. 15th of August is the due date for everything. So if you want to try this QGIS exercise and if you have questions, you can ask us. And then homework is independent of all that. You will be filling out your answers on a Google form. So by 15th of August, uh, please submit the homework. So we'll have the question answer session.
So Erica, there is um, a question one. It's about radar, different bands of radar. So depending on, on each variable, Uh, yes, thank you, Amita. <clears throat> so this is Erica Podest, and I'll answer the questions related to radar. And I see that there's one uh, that says that there are different band emissors, C-band, L-band, P-band, KU-band. So actually, we're not detecting here the emissions. We're actually, this is an active system. So the satellite is sending a signal in that specific frequency band. And, and so the wavelengths will determine how deep that signal will penetrate through the medium, whether it's a vegetation canopy, whether it's soil, whether it's snow. And so depending on your application, you might want to use uh, a different band, right? So if you're looking at vegetation and you're looking at flooding under vegetation, uh, or a forest, uh, then you want to use a longer band, like L-band, for example. If you're looking at flooding that's um, under vegetation, but it's short vegetation, like say herbaceous vegetation or uh, an agricultural crop, then C-band might be better suited for that specific application. Second question is, how can I difference the urban areas to the flooded vegetated areas? So uh, optical data would not help there. I mean, if there is, um, I mean, you can see inundation, but underneath the surface is either vegetated or urban. It just quickly tells you, <coughs> excuse me, how uh, reflectance changes when there is water on dry surface or previous surface. So there's indication of water, but <clears throat> I don't think optical data can differentiate that, but I think SAR can, right, Erica? If you have- uh, Right, so the part- Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think if I read this question correctly, I think the person wants to just differentiate an, uh, an urban area, not necessarily flooded, from a flooded area, oh, right? Okay. And, and to do that with SAR only is difficult because as was shown, uh, urban areas have the same signal backscatter response as flooded vegetation. So they both are very bright. Uh, if you want to differentiate the urban area so you can uh, flood, uh, map the flooding around, then what you'll want to do is bring in another mask that indicates where the urban area is so you can mask, you can mask it out from the radar data um, or, uh, or use something like LIDAR or optical to identify where the urban area is. So next question is about LIDAR topography data. Um, I'm not aware of any global data sets based on LIDAR topography, um, but uh, in the US, as we saw in the presentation, yes, there are uh, data sets that you can. The next question is about ERDS and GFMS. Uh, yes, ERDS, uh, you can find TIFF images. You can go on site, and on site, you will see a, there are bars that you can click on and shows different layers, and you can look at those, you can download those TIFFs. GFMS has binary data. Uh, mostly, it, it is actually flood intensity or depth above threshold, and you can download those too. 
um, sometimes in, in many of these sites, um, registration may require, but uh, data are free. And once you register, you can go ahead and download. So question five is, in case of presence of clouds, what would be the type of image displayed for the data capturing tool? So again, um, only radar, like SAR or microwave data, they have all weather capability. So operational optical sensors that we talked about, Modis Lenset, um, it, that's just a limitation that you, you, when there are a lot of clouds present, you cannot see them. What people have done, and as we saw in case of MODIS, um, is there can be a composite. You can have, a, it's not like every day is 100% cloudy. So when you composite over several days, um, you can see changes in the reflectance on the surface that you can infer to as uh, flooding. So compositing may be one way. Now, um, that doesn't help in immediate like if there's flash flood, of course, uh, it's difficult to do that. But in general, to look at uh, flooding in surface, you can composite multiple images. That's one way. Uh, this is a very good question. How are defining near real time? Is it minutes or hours? And that uh, clearly depends on, on the data or sensor that you are using. So if it is the iMERGE, GPM iMERGE, near real time is last half hour, with closest half hour, because that's the data resolution. If you are using trim, it is three hourly. So it is three hour, is the next three, nearest three hours is the real time. If it is MODIS, it is daily. If it is Landsat, it is 16 days. So actually then it is not near real time, but so sensors which are are daily, such as Aqua Terra, um, GPM tr Trim, uh, they provide information. They are more near real time. So question seven is also important: is how the threshold is determined in GFMS. So uh, it really is. The, is it takes trim climatology at each point, and then based on the standard deviation, the threshold is um, is defined, and and the reference is are there on site. You can uh, read the details, but basically, it's respect to the uh, the climatology and standard deviation. Outside certain standard deviation, it's considered uh, flooding. So uh, question eight is about um, South America, Guyana, what kind of uh, flooding tools are available? I would recommend that you look at ERDS, uh, GFMS, and MODIS NRT, also DFO, the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, and GDAX, which is Global Disasters and Alert System. The tools we saw last time, they were mostly for tracking precipitation and also to look at terrain and slope, et cetera. So you can, you can use Giovanni like we did last week to look at how precipitation systems are moving around or if there is heavy precipitation or precipitation accumulation over Guyana. But if you actually are trying to look at flood conditions, the tools we saw today would be more useful. So uh, MODIS data for flood monitoring, uh, if you want reflectance data, you will go to LPDAC and you can refer to the last week's um, presentation. The website is given here where you can download data. If you want to start with reflectance data for your urban region and you want to do your own thresholding or flood detecting, then you can get uh, MODIS reflectance data from LPDAC.
Um, I'm not sure what uh, which historical data will they correct historical data if you can be more specific. Um, what is the technological methodology created for capturing the data about the located individuals either utilization for the I am not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. Uh, Erica, if there's a question, would double bounce arise due to reflection? I'm sorry, can you uh, say the question again? Yeah, question, question 12 is, would double bounce arise due to reflection? Would double bounce, so, so double bounce is a a uh, scattering mechanism, right, that involves reflection of the signal from one surface uh, to another surface and back to the satellite. So, so all of the backscattering mechanisms involve a reflection of, of or scattering of the signal. Uh, so I'm not sure I understand the, the question. But basically, What's important for you to know is that with radar, uh, when you're looking at flooding, especially in, in areas where there's vegetation, the signal is dominated by what's called double bounce scattering. Question 13 is, can you download data in GFMS? Yes, you can. Uh, if the flood depth, you can. So how accurate is NRT MODIS data for flooding? And uh, that question depends on two parts. One is, um, is there if there is a lot of clouds, you probably will miss surface inundation, you won't be able to see the surface. So right there, there's a source of um, inaccuracy. When you can see surface flooding, there are two factors uh, that can add um, uncertainty. One is cloud shadows. If the clouds nearby and they're casting shadows, uh, reflectance are affected by that and can be misinterpreted as water. That could be Terrain shadows, if you're close to mountain, and same thing, those shadows can be interpreted as, as water. But both these are actually corrected now. So you, it, it really depends on which area you are in, and it, it helps to validate. When you see MODIS inundation, you also can uh, check in situ measurements uh, whether there is any flooding going on. The question is the satellite able to detect plastic debris in the ocean? So the satellites that we have been talking about, um, I have not seen uh, those observations being used for looking at any debris. Um, some optical and SAR data have been used to look at the oil spill, but I am I'm not familiar with any studies. They have been used for monitoring plastic debris. Also, the size would matter, resolution would matter. So the question is how the knowledge of this webinar can be used for rural setting. Actually, all these tools and data that we talked about, um, they are applicable everywhere. Our focus was on urban area because in a way it's more challenging because, um, because of the impermeable surfaces, because also buildings and roads, um, the stormwater system that's involved in there. And um, so rural area, you can use the same technique, same data. 
same tools. So in uh, WGS84, uh, it's a geographic uh, projection you, you can use for the project. Uh, yes, so uh, publication list where we can, we have provided a few publications and then what you can, you can go to those publications and look at the references in there. But um, that point is well taken. We may think of providing more information about published literature. Ah, so this is the raster call impervious areas has number between zero and 200. So 200 is actually uh, no, no data, it's not uh, data. Zero to 100 is the valid data. Everything outside, not availability or all that is set as 200. And I don't think all permeable surfaces are set to 200. So it is just where you do not have information about impermeable surfaces, that's where you are going to put 200. That's what it is. But that's a good question. So yes, MODIS and Lancet, both these data uh, are long-term. MODIS started up, uh, Terra in 1998. So yes, for at least last, 18, 20 years, you have MODIS data and then Lancet data for more than 40 years. So there are long-term data. So analysis, not available for all these years, but um, data are available. So you can do your own analysis for your urban area or any area that you're interested in. Um, Okay, so this is the SAR information. Okay, this is uh, question 22 um, about homework one. Actually, there was no submission for homework one. Um, it was mostly for your own information just to be able to navigate through um, GDAX to get terrain data and just to get the QGIS data, also register for NASA Earth data. So now and in future, you can download data. So there is nothing to submit for homework one. Homework two, on the other hand, is a Google form. Uh, you, the homework is on the website and you can download and answer your questions on the Google form link provided in there. So uh, question 23, uh, that, that really is the challenge in tropics, you will have a lot of clouds. So for DRR, I think best thing would be to start with, say, it, in tropics, usually uh, flooding would occur because of heavy rain or convective systems or tropical storms. Uh, so basically monitoring precipitation would be very helpful in tropics. So that's the first step. Um, you can also look at tools like ERDS um, because they are based on precipitation and precipitation climatology. Similarly, GFMS, so where clouds are not um, attenuating or they're not affecting um, your outcome, especially so that in, in case of precipitation and in case of hydrologic modeling like GFMS, you actually can have some idea of where uh, the flooding may be going on or uh, there's forecast component to all these so you can see um, where there is likely to be flooding but surface inundation I think SAR may help uh, when possible again there are challenges with SAR too but better than optical sensors uh, chances are that you can see the surface through SAR than Lancet or Moody's so uh, in, in that case, like in tropics, that's why I think 
flood modeling helps more. And again, it's the combination of remote sensing, in situ, and modeling that would probably help. So is there any special tool for classification of LiDAR data? Um, I am not familiar with any um, tool, uh, but I can look into it. And if we find it, we will uh, include it in, in on our website somehow. Yes, so negative SRTM data are actually null data. There are also places where there are no data available at higher latitudes. There also you would see some negative numbers. Um, data of LIDAR on drones, yes. So actually, um, many LIDARs that we talked about are, are not, all of them are not on satellites, they're on aircrafts. So drones and aircrafts, they work real well for LIDAR because they provide, um, they focus on certain geographical regions, small region, and provide high resolution information. But there are LIDARs flying on satellites also. Uh, I'm not, I, I know about Saral Altica, but I'm not sure if there's any special application of KA band on Saral. It's basically an altimeter mission, I believe. So um, you may be able to use it to look at height of a water body, uh, combined with other information, of course. So uh, for question 28, CDAC data validation. So for impermeable surface, if you go to the paper referred to in there, it describes how certain locations, how comparison is done. There is no local validation everywhere. Now. So how do I know if a data set is in, in real time? So when we say real time, um, there's gonna be some lag because one satellite passes over a place, collects the data, it has to transmit, the data has to be processed and then put on the website. So there's always lag of a few hours. So the um, something like iMERGE, which has four to five hours latency, that's, that's pretty good from satellite. Um, when you go to the website, it provides information, uh, whether it's real time or not. So when that's why we say near real time. It, it, there's always some lag, there's some latency. So NASA also has a site called LANS. I'm trying to find the address for that. That provides information about uh, near real time data. All the sensors available in near real time are available from LANS. Um, I'm just going to type in the chat box so you can copy. So here's the link to LANS. Um, there may be plugins for flood risk Area identification, um, I'm not familiar with that. This question 30, are there plugins, applications, or other tools that make the various remote sensing data that we covered today and output flood risk of an area? 
So there are there are tools people develop to do that. Uh, like ERDS is one such tool, right? Because they use uh, satellite data and and they come out with flood risk. But I don't think this software is available openly for everyone to use. So um, geostationary satellite combining with low Earth orbit satellite, it is possible because um, ever since TRIM, launch of TRIM, uh, there is a com the, the multi-satellite analysis combines uh, polar orbiting and geostationary satellite. So, so technique is available, whether tool is available or not uh, for anyone to use. Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. So it, 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 the technique is there, and it's been routinely done, but there is no tool where you can go in and uh, get the data combined from different satellites because it requires uh, a little more analysis, more processing, more merging. So question 32 is for Erica. How do surface water bodies, flooded urban areas, flooded vegetation areas, and polluted water have differ with respect to VHVB ratio? Okay, so what the ratio provides is it's a way to uh, identify either uh, some of the classes uh, that are confused. For example, open water has a signature of uh, very dark on the image because it's a smooth surface scatter. It's a it's a specular scatter. Um, however, sometimes when you have a little bit of roughness on the water surface because of wind, or sometimes when you have soils that have been recently tilled, then uh, you also have very dark backscatter that can confuse with with water so so these ratios um, help better distinguish them so it just depends on what you're looking at uh, open water has very different uh, signature than flooded areas flooded vegetation areas so flooded vegetation is very bright while open water tends to be very dark and you know I will talk about all of this in the webinar, the Advanced SAR webinar series that starts next week. So on Tuesday, August 7th, we'll be covering SAR for land cover mapping. And then on Thursday, August 9th, we'll be covering SAR for flood mapping. Uh, so I, I, I suggest you join that webinar to really learn more in depth about the use of different polarizations and different frequencies for flooding. Uh, one thing to note here is you do mention polluted water. That's a, that type of information cannot be provided by radar. So remember, radar is sensitive to structure and to the dielectric properties of the surface. Uh, so it, it does not uh, provide information about the, the chemical composition of of the surface like optical does. Um, so GEOS5 provides both historical and forecast weather data, yes. Uh, which polarization is preferred to detect floods with SAR images? And are there any global soil moisture data set based on SAR? These two questions are there. So you can attend the SAR advanced webinar to get more information about that. Uh, Sentinel data compared to LIDAR data, I'm not sure um, what that means, but um, 
if you're talking about resolution or features, can you please be more specific? Um, not sure about MNDWI, so so it is. Uh, if you're talking about normalized difference water index, um, that has been used. NDWI and NDVI like relationships have been used. Um, what is the accuracy? It is difficult to say. It depends on the region, I believe. Yes, actually, um, if you have in situ data, like this is question 38 uh, about weighting different layers. Um, yes, you if you have in situ data, that's the way to go. You can derive different weightings for different piece of information, how important it is. So empirically, you can derive some kind of or statistical relationship between in situ data and satellite data, and then you have proper weighting. Soil moisture impact flooding in urban area. So in urban area, wherever there is non in it, there is pervious surface, there of course there is infiltration occurring. So that's where um, soil moisture would matter. So how much water can infiltrate versus runoff or just can stand there? That will be decided by amount of soil moisture. So it's not like entire urban area is impervious. So wherever there's a surface where water can infiltrate, soil moisture does matter. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add to that because there are, mm -hmm. I think, two questions related to soil moisture. There is a, a NASA satellite actually in space that measures soil moisture globally. It's called SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive. And it's been collecting data since around April of 2015. And uh, it, it uses a, a passive microwave system to uh, measure soil moisture uh, every three days on a global basis. And there was a webinar about this back in 2017. It's on the RSET website if you want to learn more about SMAP. However, SMAP does not retrieve soil moisture over urban areas just because the algorithm uh, just works on natural environments and not over uh, urban environments. So those areas, urban areas are masked. But it is very important still to account for water infiltration in soils in urban areas, as Amita mentioned. So I think with that, um, we will end this webinar session. Thank you so much for attending uh, this session. Uh, we would like to get your feedback. There is a survey here um, that you can uh, fill out and provide us feedback about uh, the training, about the material covered, uh, other topics that you are interested in. So uh, please take a few moments to uh, do the survey and provide your feedback. It's very important to us. That helps us in designing and improving our training for future. There will actually be an email sent in uh, uh, tomorrow uh, okay. on that, and there will be a link in that. It will come from SurveyMonkey. And also, um, if and anyone is involved in urban flood management and if you have any insight or feedback uh, 
from your side, uh, that would be very helpful to us too. So on behalf of the RSET team, um, we have Rob Levins who helped us in setting up the webinar. We'll have Elizabeth Hook. And so on behalf of Erica Podest and myself, we really want to thank you for attending uh, this webinar.